Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, George Galloway. And me, Gayatri. Just a few weeks ago, it looked certain that the final round of the French presidential election would be a contest between the right and the even more right. In those circumstances, François Fillon, the mainstream right-wing candidate, would surely have the support of the centre and the left to stop Marine Le Pen, the leader of the National Front. But a few weeks is a long time in politics. Today, Fio is looking like a dead political duck, sunk by the oldest of vices, greed. His wife, who is British, maintained for years that she's a simple housewife with no involvement in her husband's politics. Except it turns out she was paid 800,000 euros by the taxpayer as her husband's political assistant. Nothing illegal in that, except critics and the French police are now investigating whether she ever turned up for work, whether she had been telling the truth all along when she said she did not work in her husband's politics. And then there is the rise of France's Jeremy Corbyn, Benoit Hamon, the new and unexpected candidate of the formerly discredited Socialist Party. If he can set public opinion alight in the way he has taken his party by storm, could the final round be between the left and the far right? And in those circumstances, who would the mainstream conservatives support? Joining us to discuss this fascinating French teaser is Dr. Russell Foster of King's College London, a specialist in European politics. Dr. Russell, thanks for coming back on board the Sputnik. Lay out for us, if you would, the runners and riders and uh, what's likely to have changed now as a result of this scandal. The French elections uh, this year are significant for two reasons. One, it's possibly the first time in the Fifth Republic that we're going to see a final presidential runoff between two outsider candidates who don't belong to the standard binary of the Conservatives versus the Socialists. The second reason this is highly significant is that the French election this year is going to determine the fate of the European Union, whether it will continue to exist beyond this year. That's something we can get to uh, in a short while. So the current uh, race for the French presidency is being dominated by four figures who we need to keep an eye on. Now, the first, as you've identified, is the Conservative Francois Fillon, who did look like he was going to uh, win the election, but now he's mired in a rather ugly political scandal. So I think it's safe to now discount Mr. Fion. He may make a comeback. If there's one thing we learned from Brexit and Donald Trump, it's that our predictions are often very wrong. The second candidate to keep an eye on is the current uh, front runner, Emmanuel Macron, who has disassociated himself from the highly discredited Socialist Party. Under Francois Hollande, the Socialists have now become deeply unpopular, and Hollande seems to be the most unpopular president in the Fifth Republic. Macron has sensibly distanced himself from this in order to form his own uh, external party, which it would be unfair to call populist. But now that he's cut ties with the establishment, it's likely that he'll get a lot more support from French voters who are highly disillusioned with the establishment parties. The third candidate who you term uh, France's Jeremy Corbyn, Benoit Hamon, he is an outsider at the moment and he might surprise us. There's every possibility that he will be able to ride on a wave of uh, French desire for change, of an alternative to the establishment. It seems possible that he'll get through the second round of elections, but at the moment, although there is a possibility for him to get through, it's not clear whether he's sufficiently popular to go up against uh, Macron. Now, this leaves us with the fourth candidate who we need to be very, very concerned about, Marine Le Pen, the leader of the National Front. She's concerning for two reasons. One is that in an era of disenchantment and disillusionment with establishment politics, and in the aftermath of Brexit, in the aftermath of the Italian referendum against Matteo Renzi, in the aftermath of Mr Trump, it seems that people like Marine Le Pen can appeal to a very angry 
segment of the population who feel that they've been abandoned by the same establishment elites who were mired in scandal. She is surely more or less guaranteed to be in the final round, given the current standing of the Front National in in the opinion poll. All of the pundits seem to be of this opinion, that Marine Le Pen is almost certainly going to get through the first round, and then in the final round it's going to be Marine Le Pen versus either Francois Fillon or more likely Emmanuel Macron. I think we can, uh, I know you say he can make a comeback, but we're talking about a one million euro scandal here. Not just the 800,000 to the wife, but 110,000 from a magazine owned by a billionaire friend of Fillon, for which she wrote two book reviews, it said, by the uh, France's equivalent of private eye, uh, Le Canard Enchaine, and then the two children who were employed at state expense. I myself think we can rule him out. If I'm right, bear with me. That leaves then uh, Hamon, Macron, uh, fighting for the right to contest against uh, Marine Le Pen. In those circumstances, Surely Macron would be more likely to get centre and moderate right support than Hamon would, am I right, so far? Well, this is certainly one way of interpreting it, that Macron is more likely to appeal to uh, more rational voters who don't want to associate themselves with the ethnic nationalism of the Front National. But one thing that I think we have to consider in the European elections this year, not just France but also in the Netherlands and Germany later this year, is that we're seeing the rise of populist parties which defy categorization yeah. according to the old left-right <clears throat> spectrum. Well, in this way, we can compare them almost to Trump and Sanders, exactly, right? Exactly. The, the supporters of Trump and Sanders. Precisely. We. Uh, we, we like to be able to put them in a, a framework of reference so we all still term people like Macron a bit more left-wing, people like Le Pen a bit more right-wing, but they are, able, they are able to appeal to the disenchanted and abandoned working class. Well, the, the French Communist Party's voting base, it said, I don't know the stats, maybe you do, is voting heavily for Le Pen <laughs> because it, it, it's blue-collar working class uh, base uh, was left basically without a home when communists ceased mm -hmm. to be communists, mm -hmm. when socialists ceased mm -hmm. to be socialists. Which is precisely the phenomenon that we saw with Brexit, mm -hmm. where we saw a very curious phenomenon of the hard left and the hard right suddenly finding themselves yes, in this thank you very unholy much. alliance. Uh, uh, I'm not that hard. Um, the, but this phenomenon also worked for Trump. Trump was elected mm -hmm. in the industrial states of America. Precisely. The post-industrial states of America. So the traditional uh, electorate who would vote for the left-wing candidates, we can no longer predict what they're going to do. Now, we can try and think of some scenarios of what's going to happen in the French elections. It's almost certain that Marine Le Pen is going to get through the first round and make it into a uh, final contest against Emmanuel Macron, because I think Fionn can be discounted. You don't think Hamon can... Uh, there is a, there is a strong a possibility. possibility, and the elections are still a long way off. Mm. A lot can change in that time. But either way, Marine Le Pen is going to be up against uh, another outsider from the establishment. Now, there are two possible scenarios that will happen here. One, the, the one that seems most likely at the moment, is that Marine Le Pen will lose. Now, if she loses, this does not mean that France's problems have gone away, that France is suddenly fully in support of the European Union, uh, that France is entirely behind the leader that they've chosen. If she wins, then that's the end of the European Union. We can safely say that. The EU can exist quite happily without Britain. Our departure might even make the EU a little stronger mm. because it removes the prime object uh, the country which has most frequently objected to further integration if france leaves that's the end of it mm. wow. so if she wins that will happen but if she fails and uh, and let's say emmanuel macron or benoit hamond win we're bo both pro, pro eu exactly pro -EU. both pro eu but they're going to be faced with a very difficult scenario where they're mm. governing a country where a huge number of voters have expressed yes. deep resentment and dissatisfaction 45 percent uh, at least i would exactly thought. so there's still going to be a lot of political support for the front national mm. and this is going to make a severe challenge for whoever is able to defeat le pen in the past it's been when the word was tossed around uh, the FN was described as a fascist party. I myself think that that is no longer accurate. Um, but it is rooted in Vichy and collaboration with Hitler 
and with anti-Semitism and so on. How much will that proved to be a millstone around her neck. Of course, this is correct. The Front National comes out of a collaborationist anti-Semitic organization. But the same accusations of uh, ethnic bias, of racism, of classism, were being leveled at the Leave campaign in Brexit mm. and at Mr. Trump in the United States. And both of those were able to survive that. And in some unpleasant uh, scenarios, it may be that people were so fed up of being termed these words that they ended up throwing their support in behind Trump and behind Leave. So Marine Le Pen... So has, throwing these words around no longer works if I don't, it ever did. No, I don't think it has the same impact anymore. Now, if Marine Le Pen had been running in the French election, say, five, ten years ago, accusations of uh, racism and anti-Semitism would have destroyed her campaign. Now, I think that Europe is moving towards an atmosphere in which people have people have become tired of these terms and they're no longer afraid of being called this. What can you tell us about France's Jeremy Corbyn? What are the similarities? Some similarities is that he will have a wide appeal outside of the establishment consensus. Britain and America are not unique in being post-industrial countries. France has its decaying post-industrial cities. France has its abandoned fishing towns on the Mediterranean coast, where people feel abandoned by the metropolitan elite in Paris and want an alternative. We complain in Britain about the dominance of London. That is nothing compared to the French and the dominance of Paris, where outside of Paris you might as well be living on the moon, according to French politics. So he will be able to appeal to a very broad electorate who are disenchanted with the metropolitan elite. However, the same disillusioned electorate are also going to turn towards Marine Le Pen, who is very, very clever at portraying herself as a woman of the people, not of the establishment. Mm -hmm. Dr. Foster, it's going to be a fascinating teaser, and we must have you back to talk about the Dutch election, where the right-wing candidate, Gert Wilders, is today ahead in every single poll in Holland. A very worrying precedent. Very nice to see you again. Thanks for joining us on the Sputnik. Thank you. Coming up next, it's the king of British radio, James Whale on Donald Trump. Don't miss it. Welcome back to Sputnik. He's loud, brash, opinionated, controversial and absolutely unmissable. And Donald Trump is much the same. James Whale has been the master of British radio airwaves for decades. And he's my colleague again at Talk Radio, as he was at Talk Sport before that. In fact, if it wasn't for him, I might not be on the radio at all. Earlier this week, he and I had a spirited discussion about Donald Trump. So good, we just had to do it again with moving pictures. James, an honor to have you here. Our argument about Donald Trump wasn't just about the politics. And I, I don't really want to talk about the politics. I want to talk about the man the personality, the phenomenon. Because I think we both agree that this is an age, an era in which your mainstream politician just doesn't cut it anymore. The people are mad as hell mm. and they're not going to put up with it anymore. Is that your view? I think you're right. I think, um, <laughs> I think uh, almost anybody who is uh, like you, George, uh, a great orator, a man who can actually enthuse the audience, uh, could if they wanted to, or a woman who could enthuse the audience, could if they wanted to move into politics. People are fed up. Uh, with professional politicians. You know, our politicians tend to come from political advisors who came from political students, uh, and then they become politicians. Not all. I mean, there are some great politicians around, but there is this kind of uh, professional politician. It is their career. Mm. And I think being, being a public servant, that must be more of a calling mustn't it? It must be something you want to do for your fellow man and woman rather than it being a career. And that's why Trump is so ham-fisted about things and so kind of slightly inarticulate, shooting from the hip, using the wrong words, tweeting instead of calling or writing or having a meeting and so on. It's because he isn't really a politician. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's doing things in a way which is completely alien to the media, the mainstream media class, even at our radio station, mm. which is hardly part of the, you know, mainstream, mainstream uh, I can sense that 
people are really hostile to Trump. Mm. They're really hostile to the sometimes ugliness of how he expresses things. He has, uh, as has uh, Jeremy Corbyn, if you like, risen on a wave of public opinion, which a lot of people may not agree with, but they have been able to, um, to galvanize that, that sort of support the same way uh, that we have voted to leave the European Union with a lot of people not actually thinking about the ramifications and we won't go into that now mm. but the same way with Donald Trump listen we've been doing badly he can get us jobs he's gonna make America great again we are all gonna benefit again now it might be great that somebody who isn't a politician although I'm not sure that businessmen aren't fairly political exactly, exactly. Yeah? That's what yeah but you know he isn't going to be able to deliver on an awful lot of what he does and if he carries on the way he is isn't he in danger of becoming a dictator well there is a danger Max Kaiser said to me this week uh, that I love he's show. going to be yeah, he's terrific uh, that he's running for office by the way he's running for he'll probably Congress, get in <laughs> yeah in North Carolina uh, he was making the point that Trump is definitely going to test the Constitution mm. but then the Constitution isn't working the political system isn't working in fact it's broken and brexit and trump and le pen perhaps in france they're emerging from the wreckage of that broken system and the danger is of course dictatorship but it's also that populism can whip up some very dark forces uh, well that's what worries me and uh, this is what worries me about brexit in a way too that there are people now who think for some reason if they don't like a foreign or a country that if it carries on the way it is they can just be rude to them disregard them or blame them mm. and you know at the moment in this country somebody comes along um, I mean I know Nigel Farage quite well as do you mm. I like Nigel I might not agree with his mm. politics mm. but he is again a good orator a man who mm. speaks about what he feels I don't think by the way he is a nasty person or believes in 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 some of the things that other people who support him think mm. on the other hand I actually think from what Donald Trump says he actually believes he can do whatever he wants and he can actually blame part of society i.e. in this case Muslims for all the ills mm. that are affecting America when it really hasn't got very much to do with them at all he is uh, of course uh, scapegoating Muslims there's no doubt uh, about that so far only verbally he's not bombing and invading them like previous uh, presidents but I wanted to test you on his other favorite whipping boy which is the media mm. he has decided that rather than sit through a hostile interview with a newspaper that's read by not very many and staffed entirely by the creatures of mm. the elite he's just going over their heads and even at a press conference he's not really talking to them mm. he's talking over their heads to the people is there any scope for that in in British politics do you think well, I think actually it's... you know that he doesn't even use the official pres uh, presidential uh, Twitter account he just uses his own exactly Twitter account. Yeah. exactly yeah I think it's already happening George you tweet out I tweet out um, I don't think the the, the so-called mainstream media the ones who look down on tabloidism whatever that might be I mean I think I'm very tabloid you're probably quite tabloid as well aren't you do you think we're tabloid, Nothing wrong with a tabloid. We exactly <laughs> 40,000 Frenchmen can't exactly, be wrong exactly exactly I I I think it's already happening I think a lot of those people perhaps who buy and read the Guardian will be very upset to find out that mmm I wouldn't think very many people no. who go to vote read the Guardian at all um, in fact, whenever I do a paper review for a, a television station, I never bother to look at it. Well, that's the fact that the, the, the experts, yeah. the pundits, yeah. uh, the political commentators and so on, they were all so wrong. I remember sitting in the RT studio when Sunderland was announced, the first result mm. in the Brexit vote, and I told the host, that's it, we're out. And even the host of RT couldn't quite believe that. Uh, and of course, on the BBC and in the mm. in the actual mainstream, uh, they reacted with horror at anyone who predicted 
uh, the Brexit victory and the, and the Trump victory. I mean, although I'm quite open and got into all sorts of trouble for my BBC show about it, I I'm, was openly against leaving the European Union, um, and which might be contrary to what people would think. And the reason I was against leaving the European Union, not because I think the European Parliament works well, it obviously it doesn't. It's too big and too unwieldy. But what worries me about today's society is nationalism and the growth of nationalism. And we were heading to be a world that was getting on with each other a lot better than we are now. The more nationalism there is, the more chance of a conflict. No doubt uh, about that uh, danger. What do you think is the future for British politics in that regard then? Because you have Theresa May, who isn't Margaret Thatcher, for all that the leader writers are trying to write her up. I knew Margaret Thatcher. Theresa May isn't Margaret Thatcher. So did she I. And I'll tell you my two favourite politicians, Margaret Thatcher and Tony Benn. Because they were people of conviction, yeah? yeah. And they were people who actually didn't have the benefits of uh, uh, an easy life. Tony Benn made it himself. I know he had a title and everything else, mm. but he was, Margaret Thatcher was the daughter of a greengrocer. Mm. They actually knew a bit more about life. Yeah. It, but they were conviction politicians, you're they right. They were. Mm. And we don't really, I mean, Jeremy Corbyn is a conviction politician, yeah. uh, but the opinion polls indicate that not many people are, are buying his shares in, uh, in Corbyn. <laughs> well, um, I, I, you know Jeremy Corbyn well. I, I interviewed him many, many times before he became leader. Now he doesn't like to be interviewed no. so much, um, which I think is a big mistake. He was quite an entertaining and interesting interviewee. But, I don't take this the wrong way, but he's not a leader. He cannot command an audience. He doesn't have whatever it is you have, George. Um, and what Nigel Farage has, there's something that you need to have to Je command or star so quality. <laughs> well, <laughs> say quoi, as we're discussing or the X factor. Yeah. Yes, well, the, the X factor, factor is exactly. a, a good way of, uh, of uh, putting it. Because if Simon Cowell mm. went into politics tomorrow, Simon Cowell could become Donald Trump of the United Kingdom. Oh, don't give him ideas. Well, that was my, that was my last question. Um, <laughs> can people see... You are the king of radio. You've got an opinion on everything. You express it But I'm just like everybody everybody. else, and you and everybody else. If I sit in a pub with my mates, we're all having conversations like this. Mm. I'm just very lucky that I was never very well educated, so that I was just left to, to, to uh, find jobs where I could talk my way into but them, you, George. My point is you could be the, the Trump uh, of Britain, because Trump was the guy off The Apprentice. Yeah. Uh, of course he made a bit of money, I think not nearly as much as he claims he made, mm. but his size of personality in America came through mm. reality television. Wouldn't Not that in... be terrible? I, for a joke, when the London Mayor was first announced, mm. I actually said to Nigel Farage, I'll be UKIP's candidate for mayor. And Mrs W and I were driving to the ITN studios one night and she said to me, right, you have to stop this because they're beginning to take you seriously. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I did. If I'd been... I'll tell you what, George, I'd never thought about politics until I got, I got into, into what I do by being a DJ uh, in the clubs, then getting to be a DJ on radio, then realising that I, I enjoyed talking more than playing mm -hmm. records. If I had had a different sort of upbringing and different start in life, maybe I would have gone into politics. Well, never say never. James, uh, because uh, you're younger still than Donald Trump, ah, just and, uh, and a bit more uh, fighting fit. James Whale, King of Radio, thanks for joining us. My on pleasure. Sputnik. And now it's your turn to tell us what you think through the portals of social media. What's rattling, Gayatri? First of France, we asked whether Benoit Hamon, the French Jeremy Corbyn, whether he's going to change the course of the French presidential election. And Bongo says if he's anything like Corbyn, then resoundedly no. <laughs> well, look, uh, uh, Benoit has energized the party base, party faithful. So did Jeremy Corbyn. So far, Corbyn hasn't set alight the wider electorate's hopes and uh, wishes. Uh, the big question is, can Hamon? Now Trump, is he heading for an early exit or is he actually an agent for change? Kate says, 
Trump is supported by powerful forces. I reckon he's there for the long haul, unless others take him out. Well, these are not mutually exclusive. He can be an agent for change and still be headed for an early exit. I fear uh, for his safety. I think that there will be an attempt to get him out as having broken the Constitution uh, in some way, some kind of impeachment. Uh, well, but the, whole he, the whole media hysteria is already in a That's thing. what it's about. Yeah. But if he goes the distance and gets through this, he might well be that agent for change. Well, that's all the tweets we have for today. Which, alas, means that's all we've got time for. But you can stay in touch with us on Twitter and Instagram, RT underscore Sputnik, or on Facebook, Sputnik on Russia Today. It's goodbye from me, Gayatri. And from me, George Galloway. It's been marvellous.